Hi, I'm Becky with Vox Vox Productions, and here is where you come as an independent artist to learn everything you need to know about the music business. This is part of the Know Your Biz segment for empowered indie artists. Today, we are going to be talking about who's who in the music industry and when you might need to have them in your on your team, um, when you might need to look for them. We'll start out with probably the most common, which is manager. People always think, when do I need a manager? Do I need a manager? I can't figure out what I'm doing, so I must need a manager. When actually, a manager for an artist is someone that should come along a little bit further down the road after you've got your own momentum going. And the main reason for this is that most managers work on a commission basis. They do not make money unless you are making money. So if you are starting from ground zero, you're not really going to find a, an ethical and good manager who's willing to work for a percentage of your income when you're not generating in, any income. So be wary of that. Um, a lot of times um, managers are found in a really organic way. So if you are out looking for a manager, that's probably um, not going to be the, the right manager for you. But oftentimes if it's someone who's already a fan of your music, who already has um, some idea of who you are, what your brand is, what your message is, and has some experience in the music industry, or can connect you with someone that they know, Oftentimes, these are made organically. Um, I've heard it compared to when you're actually looking for someone to marry because the manager relationship with an independent artist is probably the most important and most intimate relationship that you're going to have with any other team member in the music industry. So if you are out looking for a manager and you just instantly grab the first one that you find that says, oh, I'll be your manager. Uh, that's You can equate that to um, getting on a dating app and the first person that says, hey, you're hot, let's go get married, then you know, that doesn't make any sense. You've got to give yourself time to get to know one another, make sure that you're aligned in all areas of life, not just that they are willing to do, you know, some things for you or have some connections. You really have to make sure that morally, ethically, they're on the same page as you and that they get you. It's a very important relationship, so don't rush it. Another title that can have a variety of meanings is producer, a music producer. So I'm a music producer and I've had people um, think that I have connections and that I'm almost like a manager where I do have a lot of the knowledge that a manager would have, but I'm not interested in being a manager. That's a 24 seven type of job. I'm not interested in doing that. I love creating music and that's why I'm in the, t the studio eight hours a day at least. So a producer is generally the person that is in charge of the music that you're making. A producer can be the person that really um, refines, defines your sound. It can also be that you work with several different producers so that your sound has a variety. Um, if you look at any of your favorite artists, like Taylor Swift, for instance, you will see on her albums, there's almost always at least a few producers on that album. One producer might do four tracks, another producer does three, another does two, and um, that's because she knew for this song, I need the flavor that that producer gives me. Also, a lot of times producers are involved in the songwriting, the actual creation of the song itself, and if you make a connection with a producer that you write well with, that is a very valuable relationship. But also, a producer is... Um, in today's world, oftentimes it's the one who's doing the recording and the editing and the mixing. Not always, but it's very common. I'm a producer who 
loves to help with everything. Um, other than the very, very last stage of making music, the mastering, which I 99% of the time outsource to a real mastering engineer, um, I love to do all of it because that's where my passion lies is in the creation of music. And so I love to write, you know, make sure that the lyrics are great and the melodies are great. And then I love coaching singers in the studio because I'm a singer myself and I coached singers for years. So it, I feel like I can help singers get great performances in the studio. And then I love, I don't know why, what's wrong with me, but <laughs> The, the process of editing vocals, a lot of producers and engineers hate because it's very tedious, time consuming. You have to really like zoom in with your ears to specific things. And I love that part. And also mixing, which is the balancing and, and then the production itself, which is um, arranging, like deciding what instruments belong here and what their sounds are going to be. And it's, I love it all, but not all producers do. So when you're looking for a producer, make sure that, first of all, you understand the scope of their work. That's the main thing. If you think you're getting a producer that is going to help you create your own sound and be creative and inventive with um, you know, new ideas in production and the arrangement, but really all they do is hit record, you're in for a surprise and maybe even a disappointment when the final product comes to you and you're like, I do not like this. This sounds really amateur. Um, so just understanding the scope of what that producer that you're going to hire actually does is really important. And when do you need it? When you have songs that are really, 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 really good. Do not rush this process. Okay. <laughs> Enough of that. Promoter. A promoter can be someone who locates and hires talent for a specific event or venue. It can also be you. Um, there are promoters who are independent and oversee specific events all over the world, or there are promoters, talent buyers, who might work for the venue itself and will seek out talent to book for their venue. Um, but you, as an independent artist, as you're getting started, most likely you are the only promoter for you, but you might eventually get in contact with the promoter for a specific event, like a festival or um, anything like that that's happening in your local music scene. More than likely, you'll be contacted by a promoter or talent buyer who is interested in booking you for an event rather than you reaching out to them. The promoter is most likely paying attention to online buzz, especially in cities where they might have an upcoming event to promote. The promoter may also find lesser known artists for potential opening act slots by researching headlining artists, fans, and what other are artists are, or bands those fans are following. So bottom line is if you wanna attract a promoter, you have to have stuff going on. You have to be creating your own PR, your own press in especially your local community or if it's an area where there's a festival and you really want to get on that festival, making sure that you're involved in sub events in the town of that festival so that they're noticing who you are. A booking agent is another one that a lot of people think they need right away um, when they're first getting started. But a booking agent, um, well, first of all, who they are, what they do, they connect performers, artists, and acts with venues, event planners, and companies that need entertainment. Um, so booking shows as an original artist or a band versus um, a cover band or cover artist is drastically different. I was in a cover band for years, and uh, my sister, it was her band, she worked for the booking agent that um, did all of the bookings and their highest uh, booking acts, like the ones that booked the most and actually made really good money were cover bands. Okay, eye opener. These are because companies like Microsoft, they're having their annual party in you know the Bahamas. They need a high, high quality, high energy live entertainment and um, they're only gonna get that from not 
looking at all of the cover bands individually, but they go to a booking agent that says, oh, we've got, these are our five top tier cover bands, and here's what makes this one special, here's what they, makes this one special, and so on, and then they're like, ooh, that's too much money. Well, Microsoft probably wouldn't, but maybe they would. And so they'll be like, what's your next tier down? It's basically like you can go to a store and look at the shelves of cover bands. And anyway, most booking agents are um, commonly working these types of acts that um, are already branded, they already have a look, they already have a style, they already have a feel, and they're giving people who contact them many different options for what they might want for their entertainment. Um, let's see. So as an original band or an independent artist, you are often going to play the role of booking agent for much of your um, career, at least as it's getting started. And then at um, some point, either your manager will be doing a lot of the booking or you can find a booking agency that um, will, that takes on original acts. Okay, PRO or Performing Rights Organization. Um, PRO is a collection agency for songwriters and publishers of performing performance royalties for the underlying composition in the US. They also act as advocates for songwriters and publishers. When should I hire one? Well, basically you don't hire a pro. You actually need to register with a pro as soon as you have written an original song and have plans to release it. It doesn't matter if you think it's going to hit a million views or not, um, or streams, you just should go register. With BMI, it doesn't cost anything to register as a songwriter, and they also will collect your performing, or I'm sorry, your publishing performance royalty without a publishing company. Um, ASCAP does charge $50 to join as a songwriter and $50 to join as a publisher. And you have to register as both a songwriter and a publisher in order to collect both. Um, many people say, what's the difference between ASCAP and BMI? They really are doing the same thing. That's, to me, the main difference is when you're first signing up. If you are like, I don't have even $100 to sign up with ASCAP, then you can sign up with BMI. The difference is, is once you start um, really getting a more prolific catalog, you want to establish your publishing entity with BMI, you can start your publishing um, or start collecting the publishing royalty as a publishing entity, but it's going to cost you $150. See, that's where the scales now tip. But when you're first getting started, really, um, BMI makes it very, very simple. And if you get to that point where you do want to register as a publishing company, hopefully $150 won't break the bank. Now you can't belong to both. You can, as a publishing company, you can have a publishing company with BMI and a publishing company with ASCAP. Um, it's a great idea actually to do that if you start pitching your songs to um, different artists or different publishing companies you're going to want to be aligned with both of them. Um, or if you're working with other writers that are working, um, that you might sign to a publishing company, then you're going to have to have um, an entity with both ASCAP and BMI. <laughs> it's so complicated, right? Okay, so hopefully that answered that. Now a publisher, a music publisher, is usually a business and their main focus is exploiting songs. They want to pitch the song. They are not necessarily out there to promote or pitch an artist. They are only interested in exploiting songs or finding songs for the, a particular artist. Um, when should you hire one? Generally, you are going to be approached by a publishing company or you're going to apply, submit a song that might be accepted by them and they say, okay, yeah, this is a song I think we can pitch. Um, we'll go ahead and send you a single song publishing agreement. It's usually a couple of years 
and it usually says if they're going to be the exclusive publisher on your um, contract on the, this particular song. Most of the time they want to be the exclusive um, shopper publisher and um, now sometimes publishing companies do sign a songwriter to a, an agreement with them. So if I'm a songwriter and I'm really prolific and I'm getting all these hit songs, then I might get approached by a publishing company that says, okay, we want to sign you to be on our staff and just write, 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 write all day long for us, which could be great. And they may even pay you a salary, plus you get songwriter um, royalties for every song that you cut. Now they get the publishing royalties, which if you understand publishing and songwriting, that can be about a 50-50 of the performance royalties and mechanical royalties. So if you are really, 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 really confused about the publishing world and what that all means, I'm going to link in the bottom of this video to a webinar that SongTrust, who is a publishing admin company, um, they do webinars that explain publishing in a really, really helpful way. So I'll link to that down below which is a perfect segue into administrative publisher. Um, admin publishers who, for a percentage of your publishing income or a flat fee, they focus on collecting all of your performance and mechanical publishing royalties worldwide, while pros like BMI and ASCAP only collect performance royalties and only in the US, though they do coordinate with other collection agencies in the world, um, SongTrust makes sure that all of those royalties are being collected. TuneCore Publishing, CD Baby Pro are also admin publishing companies. But from the research I've conducted, they are mostly a headache and entangle your publishing rights enough as to scare other sync agents or music libraries away. So I would really avoid doing TuneCore Publishing, CD Baby Pro unless they eventually get that worked out. Um, ironically, CD Baby Pro is managed by SongTrust, but I have talked with music libraries who say, no, we won't touch a song if CD Baby is the admin publisher, but SongTrust is fine. I'm not sure why it is different since SongTrust is actually doing the work for CD Baby Pro. I don't know, but that's what I've been told. <laughs> Okay, um, Sound Exchange is the next one. Now, Sound Exchange collects the performance royalties earned from master recordings played on non interactive digital platforms such as Pandora, Sirius XM Radio, um, for whomever owns the master recording, usually record labels, but if you're an independent artist, it's probably you. And this is only digital, non-interactive streams in the U.S. So it's only one little teeny corner of the um, royalty world, but if you don't register with Sound, Sound Exchange as the master recording owner and slash or the artist, you won't, you won't collect those royalties. So you're just leaving money on the table. Really important to get that. Okay, um, Harry Fox Agency is the next one. Harry Fox Agency is a mechanical licensing agent. This means that they issue licenses and collect mechanical royalties in the U.S. on behalf of music publishers only for the recording and reproduction of CDs, ringtones, and downloads, which are hardly even happening anymore. Um, now, this would be something you would join you would join Harry Fox if and when you establish an actual publishing entity. But um, this year, or was it last year? Very recently, the um, MLC, the Mechanical Licensing Collective, was formed to collect these digital mechanical royalties for self-published songwriters. Now, if that's you, meaning I'm a songwriter, but I'm not signed to a publishing entity at all. I don't have a publishing company and I'm not signed to a publishing company. Um, then you need to sign up with the MLC in order to collect these mechanical royalties. 
All right, next on our list, entertainment lawyer. A lawyer who specializes in music business to negotiate contracts, review contracts, draft agreements, and at times connect artists with labels, managers, or producers. Now, when should you hire one? Um, as soon as someone sends you a contract to sign, then you should have an entertainment lawyer at least review it. You do not have to be, oh, I need a, an entertainment lawyer on retainer. That's, you know, $1,500 a month or $3,000 a month. Unless you are like making gazillions of dollars and you're Beyonce, there's no need to do that. But paying a few hundred dollars before signing an agreement could save you thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, years of headache. It's just totally worth it. So absolutely do it. I've had um, people tell me, oh, my uncle is a family lawyer and he looked at it and says, oh, it's fine. I'm like, no, this is very, very specialized law. Um, we were just talking about copyright and publishing. And if your head was spinning, imagine a lawyer who went to law school, law school focusing on family law, who's looking at all this stuff about copyright and publishing. And they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. They wouldn't know the difference between the underlying composition and the master recording in the world of copyright. And yet those distinguishing factors are like very, very important. So you really have to have, um, you really have to have access to a very good entertainment lawyer. And I know a couple, if you want to comment below, I can send you some links or, um, just look up in music connection magazine always releases annually, at least annually, a listing of all entertainment lawyers that are active. You know, that means they haven't been sued and their license hasn't been taken away. They haven't been disbarred. So great list to keep to keep handy. Okay, um, let's see. The next on the list, record label or record company. Um, now, record companies uh, traditionally, they were kind of the mammoths of the music industry, right? They would find artists and sign them to horrific deals where basically they owned everything at the end of it and had all creative control, um, but they were funding it. They were paying for everything. Um, oh wait, the artist has to pay everything back and we still own the record. Okay, it doesn't make any sense, but that business model is still happening. And what's worse is that a lot of, there are record companies popping up all the time that basically just are using the word or the phrase record company as their only credibility. And they may even lie about who they're affiliated with. Um, if a record company is interested in signing you and they want a certain amount of money from you, run away. They do not need to be paid a monthly amount or any kind of lump sum in order to be your record label. That is really what it comes down to is a record label is a company that's willing to invest in you as an artist. Then what's important is what does the payback look like? Is the artist, are you having to pay everything back plus interest? That could mean you are in debt to them forever. Um, will you own anything by the end? Do you have creative control? So a record company is really like a big bank. They're going to invest in you, but they're going to want something back in return. They're not going to just do it out of the goodness of their heart. So we could spend a lot of time talking about that. But remember, education is your first layer of protection. If you know that you, if you know at least what you don't know, and then second is take a contract handed to you to an entertainment lawyer that can then say, no, these are all the, the things that need to be changed. Then you won't sign anything that um, puts you in some kind of horrible situation. Next is A&R, which stands for Artists and Repertoire. Um, A&R execs are often seen as the gatekeepers and talent scouts for the record companies they work for. 
The title is used rather loosely these days to usually refer to someone who seeks out and develops talent. I use that term for myself often. Sometimes it depends on how I'm feeling, but sometimes I feel like that's what I'm doing. I'm out looking for talented artists to work with, and then I go through the process of helping develop them. Um, when do you need to, to hire one? Um, you don't. <laughs> you do not hire a and r they come looking for you and they will um, then present you with an agreement, which you of course know you need to have an entertainment lawyer look at it before signing. Agent or entertainment agency. An agency usually re represents a variety of entertainers, actors, dancers, models, musicians, bands, artists, trapeze artists, or jugglers. <laughs> the agency receives calls or audition notices for a variety of events and will submit the entertainment, um, or sorry, the entertainers on their roster that might be a right fit for that particular event. Typically, an agency has a specialized roster, but a much larger roster than, say, a manager does. The agency receives a percentage of what they book for the artists on their roster. When should I hire one? Um, if you are interested in other areas of entertainment, such as modeling or acting, you really should be with a, a very good um, talent agent or entertainment agency pretty much right away. And there are local agencies, I'm sure, in your neighborhood or, of course, a ton in um, Hollywood. But you really got to watch out for these guys, too. There's so many scams out there, but you really have to watch out. Oftentimes, they... Um, these big agencies, they'll host mega events, they call them showcases, where they promise um, that you're going to be performing for all of these, you know, executives. And then at the end, the person who wins gets some kind of record deal. But for everyone else, they're going to be pitching classes and trainings to you that could cost thousands of dollars, but they're dangling the carrot of, you know, well, once you're done with this training, then you'll be part of our agent, our specialized group in our agency that we pitch selectively to Hollywood, you know, so they're always going to be dangling these carrots in front of you, um, but it always comes at a cost. So just be really careful with that. A PR agent or agency, PR stands for pub public relations. PR firms will prepare press releases, write biographies and other copy for your website, create hype, get you on blogs, um, that kind of stuff, create content for radio promotions or other online promotions. When should you hire one? Now, this is uh, another one of those things that a lot of independent artists think that they, um, when they need marketing, they need PR, when that's not true. Marketing and PR are different. PR is all about press. And press is only interested when you have something happening, something happening. If you are um, releasing a single, but you release one every six weeks, you know, the press might not really be interested in that unless you're Taylor Swift or, you know, Adele. So um, if you're having a big EP release party, on the other hand, that deserves some press. Hiring a press agency or PR agency to write a press release for you, um, that could really be handy, especially if it's a local event where you want um, people to actually come and watch your concert, then you probably are gonna want to get the word out to local news stations, local radio stations, etc. I'm going to link below cyberprmusic.com because Arielle Hyatt is her name. She started this um, PR agency years ago, back when um, internet PR was brand new, actually. Um, she has incredible, incredible resources for independent artists. She really understands the world of PR, but she very much specializes in helping independent artists do their own PR. So um, I will link to her below, and she has a great book that you should definitely check out all about creating your own PR. Um, radio promoter. This seems self-explanatory, but the reality is most people don't realize how difficult and expensive it is to get on radio. There are legitimate radio promoters out there as well as really shady ones, 
but even legit radio promotion is expensive. Um, promoters will usually start with a test market where they put the song out on a few stations in a few markets, which is another word for demographic areas, um, to see what the response is. If the response is great, then they will spin the record for more frequently and put you into more markets. Um, so when should I hire one? The first question to ask is, is your listening demographic listening and discovering music on the radio? That I have people ask me that, like, what do you think about radio? Should I hire a radio promoter? And my first question is, are, are your fans listening to the radio? I don't know about you, but I rarely <laughs> listen to the radio anymore. If I do turn on the radio, it's my local news. And honestly, um, I'm, you know, I'm 50, how old am I? 51. And if I, at 51 years old, am not listening to the radio, who's listening to the radio? Well, you got to know your audience and find out if they're listening to the radio. And if they are, where and what type of radio station and um, get on that radio station. If it's a small college radio, those are usually easier to get on. Um, and you don't necessarily need a radio promoter. You can just contact the station programmer directly. But if it's a major radio station, um, good luck with that. <laughs> it's really, really, really hard to get on a radio station um, without a radio promoter. And again, you got to ask the question, what's the point? Because it can cost thousands of dollars to do one of these you know, spins with a radio promoter, and there's zero guarantee. All right, music library is next. Music libraries are the resource that music supervisors often go to when they need music for their movies, TV shows, or television series. When should I hire one? You don't really hire a music library, but if you have a song that you think would be a good fit for sync, watch my video on sync, uh, then you can go ahead and pitch your song to a music library. Most music libraries will only do an exclusive agreement for your song, which means you can't just pitch it to every single library and have all these libraries go, oh yeah, we want to bring this into our catalog. And you're like, great. Um, the agreement will say this is an exclusive agreement. It's not with any other music library, right? And you have to say, yes, it's not with any other library. So just watch out for that. There's exclusive agreements, non-exclusive. And um, like I said, most libraries are doing only exclusive agreements, which is fine. Um, but you also want to make sure that the term isn't too long. Like if it's more than two years, it might be too long, two or three. Um, then at that point, they'll say, well, at, after two years, it'll be renewable. They may sign, send something to you that says, we want to renew your contract. And at that point, you can say, actually, I have this other music supervisor that I've made a connection with that I think would really love this song. So I'm going to cancel my agreement with you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to now let this music supervisor use the song. Another uh, who's who, distribution company. Distribution companies deliver your music to all of the streaming platforms and digital download stores. Unless you are a record label, you need these guys to do it. You need this distribution company middleman. There are quite a few to choose from, a gazillion actually. And um, Ari's take, he is Ari Herstan, as I'm sure you hopefully know who he is. He's um, a blogger and a podcaster that focuses on just a lot like me, the music business, although he's been doing it for a lot longer and has a much lar larger audience. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to link to his blog below where he compares all of the digital distribution companies because you may not, you may just be looking at, oh, how much does this cost? There's a lot of factors that you should be considering when you choose this distribution company. For example, one of the artists I work with um, has a huge following in China, and yet there are only a couple of distribution companies who actually will um, send the music to China. <laughs> so with her, I had to use a particular distribution company so that we were sure that her music would get into the China market. Oh my gosh, that's it. 
what was I looking at? What was I reading? It was a blog that I posted on my website uh, quite a while back, but um, I'm going to link to that below too, so that if you want to follow along, if you want to read a little bit more or leave comments on my blog, go ahead. But I'd love for you to comment on this video. Please be sure to subscribe. I'm in the process of building my YouTube channel because I'm really really all about making sure that independent artists feel empowered to take control of their own music careers and the best way to do that is by knowledge and understanding so that's my job is to help you feel empowered all right that's it for now have a great day